Welcome to episode 160 of Goodwin Boxing's Ring Talk. Myself, Martin Theobald, and fresh back from Birmingham, maybe not fresh, Steve Goodwin, how are you, Steve? I'm good, my friend, yeah, and I'm definitely not fresh. It was a, a long night, we were in the changing rooms till half past one. Wow, I mean, we'll come on to sort of yeah. some of the timing and logistics of the the show. Um, but on top of all of that, you've also got financial year end, which as a financial advisor means stacked up with that as well. It means 18, hour, 18 hours a day work every day. And apart from when I go on Saturday, Sundays, I came straight back from Birmingham. I was on it all day Sunday. So it's just what I do this time of year. Oof. Oh, oh, and hardly, hardly invigorated, I guess, post Saturday. Well, but... I, also, I also drove through the night. I decided not to stay, sleep in the hotel. So I left the hotel at quarter past two and got home about quarter to four. I'd done the night drive well, because I thought I'd be better off at home. So, yeah, no, I wasn't invigorated at all. No, I was going to say, what's your energy like? So let's, for those that don't know, and I'm assuming most do because they're watching a Goodwin Boxing show, you had Goodwin Boxer Brad Pauls fighting in the biggest fight of his career, his life, up in Birmingham on a Frank Warren show, headlining a TNT sports show on a Saturday night against Nathan Heaney, um, fighting for the British title in what, I mean, it's been described widely as fight of the year. I mean, we're only in sort of late March, but uh, I mean, it's going to be a contender one way or the other. It was incredible, right? I was sat at home um, with a dodgy leg, sat watching it on my TV, trying not to get overexcited because I couldn't <laughs> couldn't move about. You were there in the venue, fight ends in a draw, we'll come on to all the controversies around it, um, but start with the end. How was everybody after the fight? Because Brad had just put in a hell of a perfor- a hell of a performance, and yet he didn't lose, and yet he didn't win. What's that dynamic like when you get back to the change room? And there's Terry Stewart, there's Linus Shadofia, and then there's Brad, who's just done twelve hard rounds, gone to places he's never been before, and now that adrenaline's all gone. He hasn't got the belt over his shoulder, but he hasn't lost a fight. Yeah, that must be really weird. So the the emotions, I'm watching it with Linus. So at the end of the fight, we thought it was very close. Um, And when you're fighting on an away show against a massive ticket seller, you fear the worst. Very close isn't good enough sometimes. Yeah, I mean, we shouted, I think Terry... I think I shouted at Ellis after about round nine, we need a knockout to win. And then Terry told Brad in the corner, we need a knockout to win. Because when we fought Bentley, do you remember he eased off the gas? Linus did. So yeah, this yeah. Time, we yeah said, round 12. We're, thinking, we're not going to be getting any favours off the judges here. We need a knockout to win. And he came out and uh, he, done, he he won the last couple of rounds. Um, but at the end of the thing, we, we feared the worst. So when we got given the draw... It was sort of a mixture of relief that we didn't get the decision against us. It was disappointment because we thought we should have won for other other reasons. And we think that the judges were fit. We think the judges overall, look, we can argue Brad should have won or somebody can uh, um, argue that Heaney should have won. And you can argue that to your blue in the face, right? So our feeling when we got back was, look, the referees judges it saw it. There was no hometown bias. They saw it as a draw. We can tolerate that. But we were not happy with the gum shield spitting. And we do feel that he should have had a point off. And if he had the point off, we win the fight. So we are more gutted. So we accept the judges. But if the, the one point had been taken that should have been taken, in our opinion, without a hesitation... Um, we would won. Brad said that, and I haven't watched it back yet, but Brad felt that he was about to stop him. The, and he said, and then he was pulled apart from finishing him off because of the, he was going in for the kill and then he was stopped from boxing for the for the gun shield. And Brad said, look, there was, it wasn't as if we'd broken up. I was going in for him. He said he was gone. I was going to knock him out and he was given time off. And then the corner obviously messed about throwing water on the floor and everything else. He dropping this and dropping that. So we felt 
this that was the third time the gum shield had come out. And you know and I know how many fights you watch throughout our lives. How many times does a fighter <laughs> lose the gum shield three times and twice when he was under horrific pressure? Um, obviously, they're going to say, oh, well, it, it was knocked out by a punch. Well, why is not every single punch? There was Joe Joyce was landing punches all the time on Cash Alley, knocking him around the ring. His gum shield never came out. And three times should be a point, in our opinion. So we feel that Brad, in the dressing room, it was really proud of Brad's performance, really happy that he fought the fight of his life, but disappointed that we didn't win because we should have won, because the judges ruled a draw, but we believe that Heaney would have been stopped if he hadn't been given that break. So we felt a little bit, and when I say cheated, I don't mean deliberately cheated, but we felt a bit cheated that we should have had the belts and we didn't have them. So it was a, such a mixture of of of, uh, of emotion. I hope Brad was able to take the positives from it and not zoom in on the negatives too much that he didn't have that belt around his shoulder because the positives alone were just ridiculous. So his the way he grew into that fight, because the first few rounds, and bear in mind, the only time Brad's been on TV before was against Tyler Denny, when he didn't really show up. And I, I don't know if Brad would agree with me or not on that, to be honest. No, but... he does agree. He, he said to me before, he said, I promise you I would rather be knocked out cold than perform like I did against Tyler Denny. He said, I will leave everything in the ring, I promise. And he did. Oh God! Did when he, he and when he finished, you know, I was outside the ring, and he said to me, "I promised you, I gave everything." And he did; he gave everything. And to give everything, it was a great fight. Credit to both boxers, but he shouldn't have been allowed to spit the gum shield out three times. Brad Pauls gave everything that he gave, and um, you cannot, you cannot um, fault him. He gave everything, and hopefully, we can. Um, he's still the English champion. Hopefully we can get something positive from this. Um, but I believe that he should get a rematch. He that he should he should not be allowed to move on from that fight where he where the where the gum shield came out all that many times and be allowed to disregard that. He should come back and do a rematch. Don't think they will, but that's what I believe should happen. So a few things on that. Right, the gum shield. All I'll say on it, right? I've seen enough of Nathan Heaney during his rise to sort of prominence where he's been on these TNT shows. I don't remember him losing gum shields in any other fights. It's not like he's somebody who has a technique whereby they, you know, they happen to loosen the jaw when they get hit and it go. I've never seen him do it before. So to lose it three times in one fight is a little bit off to me. As you say, Cash Ali was taking him off Joe Joyce all night for 10 rounds. Didn't lose him once. How many times have we sat at York Hall, opposite sides of the ring, you and I, and boxers have lost their gum shield, lost their gum shield? On the second one, sometimes the ref will take the point off. On the third one, you know they're taking the point. You know they're taking the... You're going to see them walk them around and go one, one, one to every judge sat ringside. You know they will. So it was mind-boggling that it didn't happen. Um and full disclosure, I didn't really sort of score the fight. I just sort of watched it on gut feel, if you like. And on gut feel, when you sort of take that algorithm and those calculations of how they performed, who's the home fighter, all these things, the crowd support, I kind of thought Heaney's going to get this. But turn it the other way, I also thought, and I said this to you off camera, the way Brad had dismantled him in certain rounds they were almost 10-8 rounds without being 10-8 rounds at certain times and you could justify at least one of them to be a 10-8 round which also is maybe up for debate and also up for question and that changes the outcome of the fight significantly I don't like seeing the champion leave having had the, the shit beaten out of him for a number of rounds that doesn't feel like champion behaviour without sticking it back on the other bloke Brad looked almost untouched at the end of the fight. Um, and so for that reason, as much as I said at the beginning, it felt like Heaney would probably win it. I also thought Brad had every right to win it. Um, and so therefore, I can't really argue with a draw. But I say you could make an argument. At least one of them was a 10-8 round. 
and the gum shield. Um, so I, I hand on heart can see why he he'd be annoyed and pissed off about it. But Brad, tremendous. Nathan Heaney as well, by the way, if you happen to be watching this, tremendous. Um, like your heart and desire to get through that fight. Because the first six rounds, rounds one to three, Heaney sort of, Brad was struggling to shut the distance. They picked up on the TV commentary in Heaney's corner, Steve Woodbine saying his feet are terrible. His feet are terrible. He can't get anywhere near you. Um, and just encouraging Heaney to pick him off and make Brad move. He was launching from too far. Brad grew into it from that point on. Grew into it, grew into it. You can see his, as a man, he was growing. His confidence was great. It was so brilliant to watch. And I say, I just, I hope he feels, Brad, I hope you're watching this. You feel you did yourself justice because you did. But yeah, that is a home perspective, anyway. Just go. I mean, I feel gutted because I think he should have, he should have won. I just think he should have won. He should have got. <clears throat> if we accept the judges were fair and they were, we should have won. You can't just keep. You can't keep losing your gum shield when you're about to be one of those rounds. He was. He was. He was going to get stopped. He was. He got rescued. It would have been a Brad Paul's win by stoppage, or it should have been a Brad Paul's win on points with a point off. He got away with a lot. He got away with a lot. Yeah. There was one um, one part captured on a Box Nation video post-fight where Brad leant through the ropes and said to Frank, thank you for having me on kind of thing. And Frank said to him something along the lines of, and it's not verbatim, but it's along the lines of, you know, you'll be back with us. Sort of you're one of us. No matter what the score was, because it was before the scorecards have been read, um, we'll have you back or something along those lines. So has that conversation taken place yet around getting Brad back on? No. All right. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier about the um, the push for a rematch. They keep talking about doing something at Stoke, presumably have to be sort of post-football season. Football season will sort of come to an end late May. I haven't looked at the dates. What are we in now? March. Let's talk June, July. Is that a possibility? Is that what you'd sort of... Well, well do you know what I, what I would say generally? How on earth... Can they sell a bigger fight at Stoke on the back of that? How can they? How can they just... And they will, probably. They'll move on as if this didn't happen. But really, the credibility of not of, of not rematching Brad and trying to sell a bigger fight at Stoke, I'm not sure that works. But Frank Warren's a brilliant promoter. I'm sure that he'll be able to play it in a certain way. I think they should do the rematch. But the rematch probably doesn't sell out Stoke. Maybe it does. Maybe it does because it was such an amazing fight. Maybe it sells out Stoke. But to be fair, I'm not sure what fight does sell out Stoke. Like yeah, outside of... They were trying to do, from what I understand, they were going to do Janabek. <laughs> um, with the greatest respect, I think as many people go and watch Brad Pauls as they go and watch Janabek. Janabek. You and I know Janabek. I'm not sure the general public do. I think Eubank Jr. is the one that would... But Eubank Jr. is fine Crawford, isn't he? I don't know. <laughs> the Eubank Jr. Know. fight would sell. That would sell for them because they would then bypass Brad Pauls with the Eubank fight. I think that, that could work for them. Um, but I don't think you can sell the fight so easily because people... How are you going to sell he's going to be Eubank when he's just had that performance with Brad Pauls, who in effect should have won? <laughs> Yeah. So it's a really hard sell. It's a hard sell to the general public, I think. Yeah, but just again, to reiterate, Brad and Nathan, two tremendous fighters. And it was that... <clears throat> by the way, I like Nathan as a person. I think he's a great human being. Yeah. He's a great advert for the sport. I like Nathan Heaney. I like everything he stands for. So it's not personal. I just think that we're talking about a boxing match and what should have happened. But I have total respect for Nathan Heaney. He's done it all the hard way. He's brilliant. The atmosphere was great. I've only got good things to say about Nathan, but it still doesn't take away what I felt should have happened in the fight. There's a difference between the person and the sporting integrity that needs to be put right, um, or the opportunity to put right. Um, but yeah, that round six to round 12, that was just what I love about boxing is that it was some of the technique had sort of been chucked out the window by that point, and it was just two blokes who were desperate to either retain or win that British title, there was still technique going on, don't get me wrong. But deep down, it's just two hard men that wanted to flatten the other one to win that British title. That yeah. was amazing. 
absolutely amazing. The amount of heart and desire. So credit to both. Um, and what I wanted to touch on as well was there was a sponsor video that Brad Paul did, the, the Pauls did the day after the fight, where he just ran through all of his sponsors, who they are, why you should go to them. Um, I recognise the background. I suspect it might have been near you, Steve. Um, but yeah, he he just gave a quick overview of all of his sponsors. The attention on Brad had never been higher than it was Sunday morning, and he took that opportunity to run through all of his sponsors, and now people know who they are. So, boxers, take note. That's how you attract and retain sponsorship, is you use your profile when you've got it, and you mention those people that are supporting your career. Even in his sort of, I'm not saying darkest hour, but I'm sure he wasn't in the mood for doing it. I'm sure he was annoyed, but it was brilliant to see him do it. Full credit to him, and he, he attracts a lot of sponsors. He deserves everything that he's getting out of the sport, Brad. Everything. Yeah. And I was proud. Honestly, genuinely, I was so proud of him. So proud of him. Yeah. And shout out to Terry Stewart and Ellis in the corner as well, and Linus being there. Done a great winning. job. Done a great job. Done a great job. And Terry's done a great job. He's added from, we've been a team from the start. When he turned pro, that we were there, we were the team. We're still the team seven and a half years later. We've been together the whole time. It's been fantastic. And he's evolved as a man, as a fighter. Um, and honestly, it was just, it was just so, I felt so proud and so happy for him. But we should have had the whole, still, I know I keep saying it, we should have had, we should have had those belts. We should have had those belts. And what annoyed me just as much is how he's still equally as good looking Sunday morning as he was <laughs> sort of. Well, he, did, he didn't get, he got, he had a little bit of a family, but he didn't, he got hit a few times, but he didn't really get that badly, that badly marked up. I mean, I mean, Nathan Heaney was cut. It was, you know, he really would. You know, he had him, Brad wasn't wobbling around the ring. That's what I was saying earlier. Sort of, I'm always left uncomfortable when the champion, not just once, but multiple times, has taken a bit of a beating around the ring. It's always a bit uncomfortable seeing them leave with the belt unless they've done something in return. It didn't feel like he'd done anything in return, really. Well, yes, you, he'd outboxed Brad for a few rounds, but... But you know talk... what I'd say to any trainer out there now? Nothing's done about this. Why do you not enc encourage fighters... Have a part of your strategy when you're in trouble. Spit 100%. it. 100%. Because if that's the rules, you can spit it three times, no penalty. Spit. Every time you're in trouble, spit the gun shield. Why, yeah. why would that not be part of boxing? Because make it look like as soon as you get hit of a punch, spit the gun shield, because that way it gets you out of a... And that really, I believe if you don't do something about it, it will be a common thing because trainers will be going, oh, look, this is part of the game then. We can play this. Well, do you know what? The board instigate a rule whereby... If it happens once, it's very difficult to prove he's accidental on purpose. Happens once, you can get away with it. And I know that doesn't solve the problem necessarily of Saturday night for the first one where Brad was in a position to stop him. Happens twice, it's a point off. Because be more disciplined. <laughs> happens three times, another point off. Would you notice in round, I think it was 11, when Brad was really back going for Heaney again, he didn't spit the gum shield out a fourth time. He took a beating there, but he didn't come out. Why did it not come out the fourth time? Because he thought by then that the ref would definitely have to take the point. So he held the gum shield in. He was able to take it in that sustained attack, but wasn't able to hold it in the other attacks. Yeah. We'll finish on it, though. Brad, yeah. congratulations on the performance and proving yourself at that level because you really truly did. He's going to get so he'll get he'll get something. We're going to sit down when he he's gone away to Cornwall for the week, and we'll sit and chat next week, and we'll sit and work out what we're going to do next. But yeah, there's lots lots of exciting things for him down the line, I am sure. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure we're going to get a phone call. Put it that way, but we'll see. Did the timing affect Brad at all? You're in the changing rooms with him. Um, I'm guessing you were told it wasn't going to be a whatever it was, eleven thirty almost sort of start time. I'm guessing you were told probably 10 o'clock. Um, did that affect him in any way? Because oh, really, like... I, thought, I thought it played to his advantage, really, because we were sitting all chilling out in the dressing room, joking and laughing. He was very relaxed. And um, we had in the dressing room, there was obviously Linus, there was his strength and conditioner, there was um, 
the, the corner team. Ben Jones, Boy Jones was in there. Cracking oh, right. Quite, quite a fun <laughs> character. He was quite good. I got to know him on Saturday. He's a nice lad, actually. I really like him. Coolest featherweight in the world. Yeah, but he's he's good fun. It's really funny. And uh, he, he was he made the dressing in a really good place. And then, obviously, the red the, the was sort of getting ready. And then, all of a sudden, the fight was all rushed to get on. And he had to rush in there. And I thought that helped him because he didn't have to think so much. It literally was, oh, okay, I mean, so there was less of a, a warm up for him. And I think that probably helped him. Although he's a slow starter anyway. So yes. the first couple of rounds, mm. he's always going to be a slow starter. But I thought he was just, you know, I don't think that caught, there definitely wasn't a disadvantage to him for sure. I was, no, no, not to say it's a disadvantage because it's exactly the same for, for Nathan mm. as well. You know, the time stays the same. Just I wondered if it sort of impacted in any way around like the mental preparation as well as the physical. You know, you must warm up and then warm down, warm up again, warm down. When am I, I think, going? No, I think Terry had it right. He knew he was potentially, if it was a stop, he was going. <laughs> so they were working out at that time. He had his gloves on, so he was ready to go. And I think, no, I think it was okay. It didn't really cause him any problem. I think gave him less time to, to think about it. It worked out, it worked okay. And it was it was a good event. I thought the, um, I've got to say, I compliment the promoters. The, the They were very fair. Um, there was no skullduggery, no sportsmanship, no negativity towards Brad. They were treated him with the utmost respect and us with the utmost respect. And I've got to give full credit to Frank Warren and his team for the way that they treated treated us all. We were, you know, we're very happy with the way we were looked after there. Brilliant. <clears throat> Brilliant. Um, yeah, so no, it was, it was an enjoyable show overall. Um, I don't know how much of you managed to catch, but sort of highlights to me, Liam Davis was, yeah, he was tremendous. Joe Joyce was lethargic, slow, question marks over what's left. Um, Dennis McCann flattered to deceive a little bit. Um, yeah, those are sort of the takeaways for me out the whole the whole evening. Um, but fair play to Brad as well for even being awake at that hour because I was falling asleep on my <laughs> sofa. I had a lot of coffee going on. Um, yeah, right, cool. So let's wrap that up. Um, I'm sure... There might be more conversation about it down the line. Um, keep an eye on it. There was a good win show Saturday night down at York Hall. Um, you couldn't go, clearly, because you're up in uh, in Birmingham. So, therefore, we're not going to run through um, the details specifically, but just the sort of outcomes of the fights. So Tom Austin beat Mark Butler. Gabriel Marsh beat Paul Cummings. Marcus Eaton beat Paul Scaife. First fight after seven years for Marcus. That was his comeback fight to put him back in. Yeah. So well done to Marcus, by the way. Big surprise, Tyler Chambers lost to Lee Hallett. Um, He's a young lad, Tyler. He'll come back. He's back. I was really impressed with his attitude. He's, he had a reversal. And um, his first thing was, I'm going to recover from this. I'm back out here, mate. I'm going to put it all right. So full credit to him and his trainer, John Carr. I spoke to John on Sunday. I've yet to speak to Tyler. I'm going to try and get hold of him tomorrow. Um <clears throat> But yeah, I thought he's he's come back with the right attitude out of it. I haven't seen the fight, so I can't comment. Um, but yeah, he. I mean, I saw his debut and I was really impressed with him. So I was, I was really shocked. Debut. I was really shocked, really shocked. Yeah, yeah. Um, George O'Leary beat Ian Morrell. Ross McGuigan beat Robbie Chapman. Um, Zoe Hunt Smith beat Beck Connolly. It's a good result. Um, and Ronnie Mullock beat Stu Greener. Yeah, that was a summarisation. So. The week before, yeah. though, we've got just catch up on the week before. Yeah, week before. So Yusef Kamari is the sort of main headline. I won't run through all of it because we've also got this Saturday's card to come. Um, but the main headline of it being Yusef Kamari won his final eliminator for the English title. Yeah, so basically it was a final eliminator after I think we covered it last time. The um, the champion was Louis Sylvester, who got knocked out. And under the rules, the normal standard rules, if you get stopped at the same weight for a higher title, you vacate. Um, so we were hoping to get it uprated to the full title. But the board ruled that, despite that being the rule that everybody understood, that they wouldn't make him forfeit the title. So the board can do whatever they wanted. And his rules manager... are chucked out a window this week. They don't count. Yeah. Um, so the rule that's there, that we are... Everybody, I'm talking from Sky and John Wishhausen to John Pegg to us, that we've seen this rule happen many times. For some reason, they decided they didn't want to take the title off of Lewis Sylvester. So 
but unless they wanted, but they, so I spoke to Luis Sylvester's manager, they wouldn't, they didn't want to move aside. So now Yusuf Kamari has been mandated for Luis Sylvester and the fight has gone out to Perspid. I just hope Sylvester doesn't vacate now because that will stick in the stomach that if they vacate now, I wouldn't vacate to let those two lads fight for the title. That's pretty enough. So I hope as long as he sticks and defends it, I've got no issues with their with them doing it. But if they go and vacate it, then I'd be upset on two fronts. One, the rule wasn't established, and two, they should have just vacated it anyway. So it's out yeah. to first bids, and we'll see how that goes next. Uh, the first bids are up at the beginning of April. So Lew Yusuf now gets his chance for the English title. So, and um, we're very confident on being Louis Sylvester. Very confident. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, yeah, fingers crossed he takes the fight and, as you say, doesn't vacate. We've discussed many times the frustration around people holding up other people's careers sort of needlessly and pointlessly, and it's it's just not... It's not cricket, is it, really? It's uh... well, they, well, listen, they obviously they asked the board not to strip him. The board obviously went with it. Just don't vacate now. Don't vacate now. Otherwise, you've just done the ultimate sin in boxing to me. So there we go. Yeah, so let's move on. This weekend, you've got Box Mania. It's not the Box Mania you wanted, is it? Let's be uh, open and honest about it. It's some of the fights you initially planned didn't quite come through, um, but it's still a tremendous card. But yeah, because it's just unfortunate. No matter what you do in boxing, there's still four, there's five 50 50 fights on there, right? So it's still a brilliant card. It's worthy of a box mania, but it could have been even better. But sometimes things don't go your way. One of the fights that was on, there would have been another 10 rounder. That's been moved on to the Wasserman card. So that was just better for the boxers. They get a better financial reward. So we've moved, we've let Wasserman's have that fight two weeks later. So that took one of the title fights off, but there's no problem with that. But the fights that are left on here is still a brilliant show, far in excess of most small shows you'll ever see, because they are genuinely fights you can't pick the winners of. Yeah. Um, so let's have a quick run through where we are. So I've got it in front of me here. Um, so we've got Giorgio Isiela um, yeah. against Dale Arrowsmith. Well, that, that, that's what you call, he's one of the, Giorgio, is, he's on the show because he's supremely talented and I, he's one of the lads that I've got really high hopes for. Um, and obviously, it's, this fight is what it is. This is his second fight and it's his development fight. But he's supremely talented and it's worth watching him because he is a star of the future. But I'm not yep. going to say that's a 50-50 fight because it isn't. No, no, I'm going to run through the development ones first. Um as you say, they they are development fights, and they are there um, because they've sort of earned the right to be there. Because yeah. you know there are gaps in the card where you had other fights planned, but you give those opportunities to the ones that are up and coming and really impressed you in some way. Uh, not to say others haven't, but these are the ones that get the opportunity this time. Um, Lewis Oakford, big cruiserweight against Robbie Chapman. Yeah, so basically, Lewis is um, he needs a fifth fight so that he can start qualifying for titles. I really rate Lewis. He's really good. And he's going to be really bothering the domestic cruiserweights. But this, again, uh, Robbie will be there. I'll give him good four rounds. But Lewis is, is a real star of the cruiserweight division. we just got to get him moving and get him moving on to titles after this. But no, I'm really impressed with Lewis. He's very exciting. And uh, he's always great to watch. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. Brilliant. Um, Joe Camichi. Uh, versus Jack England. That is actually going to be a better fight than you would think because Jack England is far better than his um, than his record. Far, far better. And that'll actually be a cracker. That's opening the show. And that's a cracking fight, that. Um, I expect fireworks for that. And I, I think that's a fight worth watching. So if you're coming Saturday and if you're lucky enough to have a ticket, then be there early. Then we got um, Mikey Saki having a, a tick over, essentially, isn't he, against Stu Greener. Yeah, I mean, Mikey, <clears throat> Mikey's um, going to be defending his English title in June. And this is, rather than staying inactive, he wanted to um, get back in the, get in the ring and keep the momentum going. And, and it was very difficult to get anybody to box him because he's just won the English title with a knockout. Stu Green is a tough man with Mark Kemp. Thank you to him for taking the fight because the original opponent pulled out on Monday. So we got Stu Greener in last minute. So thank you to Stu for stepping up to the plate because... We needed somebody too. So, and Stu Green is a tough man. That'd be quite a good fight for Mikey. Good fight. Yeah, he is. 
He is. Um, Armas Balazzi against Mikhailo Softus. Now that's a better fight. That is actually Softus is actually quite decent. If you look at his record, he only loses to decent people. That's actually on last. Um, he's done uh I've done around, I think he's done 300 tickets again. So we're gonna have the Albanian massive out. Um, and the only reason he's done 300, that's all we could give him because the event sold out, so we couldn't give him any more. But he's done really well with ticket sales. It's going to be electric atmosphere in there. And we put him on last because the Albanians like their hero to be on last. And we're happy to, to oblige. Brilliant. Um, right, now we're going to come on to those 50-50 fights we sort of discussed. So George Hennan against, you pronounce it, Steve. Um, Anios, whatever it is. Estadios <laughs> Antonis. Now, he drew with Tion Gibbs on a sky card. <laughs> Tion Gibbs won their prize fighter or their version of prize fighter. Really talented. And um, he drew with him. And I watched that fight and I thought he beat Tion Gibbs. So he's really good. George Hennan, <clears throat> he, he, um, I've been really impressed with George, but he did have a slip up where he fought Ben Fields in an English eliminator. It went wrong for him. He missed, he done the weight wrong. So what we've said is we want a competitive fight at championship weight for him so that when we do move into championship level, he's proved he's gone through the same routine as he did in his fields without it going wrong. This is not a really tough fight. They fancy this fight hugely from Greece and they've come over with a full team. I mean, they really, really fancy it. And um, it's a fight where George has to win this to... Uh, be able to say, well, yes, I'm going to become a force in the super lightweight division. Um, so it's no walkover, that's to say the least. Of course, I fancy George to win. I think George is exceptional, and I think he's far better than it looks on paper, but he's got to overcome this very, very tough opponent over eight rounds. And you know, I love George because he's sort of, he's all or nothing, isn't he, really? He's sort of, he's those last six rounds of Pauls versus Heaney. That's George's sort of career. He's He's got that. I know he's got that kickboxing background. I've known George. I've known of George for many, many years. Um, he's, just, he's an exciting fighter. He sort of brings everything to the ring with him. Um, so yeah, if you're down there, make sure you're there for the Henham fight. You'll enjoy it. Um, Southern Area light heavyweight title. Timon Duglin against Balraj Kara. It's a great fight. Balraj Kara is managed by Harry Holland. He's only lost two in nine. Um, he's he's coming to win. He sold quite a few a few tickets. Timon Duglin, I've been very impressed with. He's very, very exciting to watch. I mean, that could be a gunslinger, that fight. Timon Duglin, I, he fought, he took a kid of 2-0 and o called Rob Parry, who came to win, and it was just a gun gunfire. It was unbelievable. And he's always in exciting fights, and I think that fight, again, don't blink, is what I say. I think that, I, I think that fight goes inside the distance. Then you've got two unbeaten lads for the Southern Area middleweight title. So, Constantine Williams uh, against P.A. Gordon. So, Jermaine Williams is trained by Terry Coulter, who I'm very good friends with. Um, he came to me. He was previously with another manager. His career wasn't going places. He's come to us. I've put him with Terry, and we've got him a Southern Area title for, in line with what I promised him. Not an easy opponent, though. Paul Gordon has been sparring with Brad Pauls. Brad Paul says he's really decent. And um, he's trained by Martin Bauer, so that tells you everything. That's a proper fight. But I think that Jermaine is a special talent. It's late on in his, he's doing it later on in, he's 34 now. But I think he's a special talent. I think he'll bring it. I think it's going to be a fantastic fight, but I, I have Jermaine Nick in it. But it's going to be a very, very, very good fight. Excellent. Um, one of my favourites, William Weber, um, taking on Rizyard Levicki. Now, Levicki was a top amateur for in lots of big competitions, highly regarded, a Kevin Merry fighter, trained by Pat Barrett. They think, they, they think they're winning this. But William's got to beat these type of opponents if we're going to go where we are. He's been nominated in a final eliminator for the English title against another Kevin Merry fighter. Rather than wait for that, we're going to take Lewicki. Hopefully, should be playing beat Lewicki. And then we've got a purse bid to contend with for the final eliminator for the English title, which we're going to take that, all things being well, after Saturday. <clears throat> but it's time for William now to show his talent and step up. He's a, You know he's an exciting fighter. I fancy him to win. But they're coming down. They think they're going to win. They really do. Pat Barrett thinks they win. They really fancy this fight. 
Yeah, not dissimilar to what you're saying about Paul Gordon being trained by Martin Bowers. Martin Bowers doesn't get involved in the careers of poor fighters. Um, Pat Barrett doesn't get involved in the careers of poor fighters. Lewicki is undefeated. That's a proper test for Weber. Another um, great fight. Yeah. And as I say, William is one of my favourite fighters anyway, just generally as a bloke, as a fighter, as how his career has been sort of rebuilt with yourselves. So, again, make sure you're down there for that one. And the final one's a really intriguing one. Um, ten rounds between Albano Jr. and Joe Underwood Hughes. Well, Albano Jr. is with Andy Gill. And we really want, they want to move him quick. So we've taken this 10 round contest with Joe Underwood Hughes, who's eight and two, no mean, no mean, no mean slouch, and he's coming to win as well. And Albano, or Junior as he's known, has really got to step up. This is a proper 50 50 fight. You've got the experience of Hughes, who's mixed at a much higher level against the precocious talent of the Lutonian Junior. It's a brilliant, brilliant fight. Again, I mean, when you say we might not have the headline bigger title fights, but this is in terms of quality of fights, in terms of there's five fights there that nobody would nail their colours to the mast on any fight. And do you know what? Saturday night proved you don't need world titles to make brilliant fights on TV. In the same way on small hall, you don't necessarily need the titles to make brilliant fights. You need well matched fighters, and that's what that is. I've been in the gym down at Evolve with uh, Junior and watched him spar um, with Andy Gill sort of overseeing it. And he's a he's a fun fighter, Junior. Um, he needs a bit more experience, I think, by his own admission. This is what Saturday night will give him, um, that experience. So that's a, a cracking fight and a real test for him. But is it is it too early? We'll find out on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Andy Gill is super confident in him. I know that. Um, so, yeah, we'll find out Saturday night. Unfortunately, I won't be there because my legs are knackered. But um, I will be keeping a very, very, very keen eye on the outcome of a number of those fights. And we'll, and we'll have it. We'll have the fights all be, they'll all go up online within a week of the fight. So we'll be able to, you'll be able to see them. But I think there's, I mean, I'm really looking forward to Saturday. Really looking forward to the card. And sometimes you don't look forward to all the cards. But Saturday, I'm really looking forward to it. Even from the start with Joe Kamichi, to seeing Lewis Oakford, to see Mikey Sackie again, to see Giorgio Osala, et cetera, et cetera. The big 10-round title fights, the George Hennon fight. It's a fantastic card, start to finish. You've got an English champion having a tick-over fight on an undercard. Yeah. It's great. It's a, yeah. It's a cracking card. Um, Unfortunately, Goodwin Boxing don't stream cards because I can't get there and I'll be annoyed at home. Um, so <laughs> don't don't go believing any of the streaming trolling. Oh, no. Do you know how many emails I get demanding money back because they keep paying, people keep paying for this and say, just couldn't have our money back. It wasn't real. And I say, go and sue them. You can't, this streaming stuff is nonsense. It just carries on and on and on. But people keep paying for it and we keep getting emails asking us for our, the money back and it's not us. So yeah. Yeah, no, do not go and pay anything for streaming services of Goodwin Boxing shows because they are not streamed. <clears throat> um, much to my annoyance on Saturday night because I won't be able to watch it either. Mm, exactly. But we'll find out next Tuesday how it all went, Steve, because uh, we're going to get back together and discuss it all. Yeah, there'll be a lot to talk about next week. And um, yeah, there's, there's so much going on, say, with the with the people that are out for purse bids and got to deal with Linus Shadofi and his next move. And so we've got so many things to, to talk about. Zach Shelley and other stuff that's going on. So we'll, have, we'll chat, chat about that next week. Brilliant. All right. On that note, we should leave it. Again, shout out to Brad Pauls for his performance Saturday night. All the team involved. Tremendous effort. Um, and let's hopefully look forward to a rematch for it. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much, Steve. And we'll see you all next week.